All right, uh, as, as Tim said, this, this was kind of thrown together uh, the last minute, almost literally, and, and I apologize for it being a little rough, uh, but you guys are my beta version, so we maybe go on the road after this if it works out okay. Um, and, and then there's some technology that I'm going to have to, to master here at the last minute. Uh, please uh, bear with me. One of the biggest problems, of course, is that uh, uh, there's just a whole lot of information out there and trying to percolate it down and cull out the information so that you guys get just the essential, hopefully the essential that you need to make good decisions because that's what this is all about. If you've got good information, uh, you can make good decisions. Uh, uh, sadly, uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there right now. And, and uh, I, I hope to avoid uh, sharing any of that with you, but I, I'll uh, do my best to, to stick with the science. And I mean science, not in quotes. I mean real science, because we've been getting a lot of uh, what people are attributing to science, which really is not. And so I'll, I'll address a few of those things. So it's the COVID-19, it's got a lot of names, uh, uh, some disparaging and, re and referring to the, the place where it came from. Uh, it's COVID-19 because it's uh, the World Health Organization broken on coronavirus, infectious disease, 19, or 29, of 2019 when it, was, when it first showed up in uh, Wuhan, China, or at least they admitted that's when it was first there. And so that's where, and, and then a lot of other names. What I hope to do today is to break it up into three parts. What is the virus itself, the it, and a little bit about the biology of viruses in general, real brief on that to help you better understand what kind of a pathogen or infectious disease that this is. And then uh, you as an individual and what, can you, what do you have on board that helps you uh, and keeps you protected in this. So we'll talk a little bit about our immune systems and, and I could spend a week talking about it because that's my favorite system in all in, in, our, uh, in, our, uh, in our bodies, but uh, we, we, uh, maybe, maybe some other day we can do that. And then, and then the us is the public health implications, us being a group of individuals that are uh, affected by this and how how do we respond? Okay, viruses in general, the it. Okay, the they're very tiny. Um, I got some numbers here. You can have seventy thousand to a million of them lined up in an inch, and depending on the kind of virus, because they're different sizes. Okay, we can't see them with our naked eye. We can't even see them with a regular microscope. You have to use an electron microscope to get them to be big enough so that we can actually see what they look like. Okay. And, it, and uh, um, the uh, size, a scale right there as an example, and it's not probably showing up very good there at the top of the scale are the kind of cells that we have in our body, right? Like our red blood cells and our skin cells, okay? And that's at the top up there. And then underneath that are the cells that are bacterial in nature, another type of infectious particle but uh, uh, much smaller than our cells. We've got millions of them living on us as part of our normal microflora or biome, our microbiome, which we'll talk a little bit about as uh, protecting us. And of course, there are a lot of pathogens that are bacteria like uh, whooping cough and tetanus. And then down below that, you can see we got the virus particles. and so. Bacteria can be infected and are infected by viruses. That's uh, the, the nature of nature is for that to be occurring. And then down below that, all the way down to the atoms. So that's the scale we're talking about, something really tiny. And, 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 this, is, and this is what makes this a problem for a lot of people. If they can't see it, it must not be a problem, all right? But it's there, okay? And that's a, that's a, that's, that's a big take home, okay? Don't, don't, be comfortable because you can't see dirt and therefore that must be something that's clean and I can, I can, I can get in touch with it, okay? Viral particles are, and bacteria you can't see. We say they're non-living because they can't exist on their own. They have to exist in our cells or in the cells of other animals and plants. And so in order for a virus 
to propagate itself, re reproduce itself, to make its proteins and to do its damage, it has to get inside of our cells. And then what it does is it takes over the mechanism that's already been set up in our cells and it co-ops that mechanism to make its own uh, viral particles. And so it can then go on to infect other cells. So can't exist, can't live unless it's inside of one of our cells. And the viruses have all kinds of ways of sneaking into our cells and the coronas. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what that does. There, there's two ways that the viruses pass on their genetic material to the next generation. And one is using DNA and the other is using RNA. Our cells, we use DNA only. Viruses do both of those. DNA is really is more stable in relationship to RNA. So RNA type viruses we're going to see uh, are going to have the ability to change more rapidly because of that instability and I'll give you some examples of that. Okay. Another important characteristic of viruses is they come in on another two categories. They either have a lipid base or fatty based envelope around them or they're what we call non-enveloped or naked. In other words, there's no fatty layer around them like that. Now, ironically, the naked viruses are much harder to kill as a result. The virus we're talking about today has an envelope around it, and that's going to be important for how we deal with that virus. Okay? They're very simple in their structure. This is an example of a, of a virus here. In the middle uh, of that, the, the blue, I don't know if I, no, it's not going to work. Let's go, yeah. Oh. Yeah. All right. In the middle, that uh, the blue area in the middle there is their RNA, their genome. Not many genes. We've got almost 30,000 genes. A virus might only have about 12. And because they, they don't have to make a lot of stuff like we do in order to be what we are out here. And so they're very simple in that regard. Surrounding that nuclear core there where they're D, their RNA or DNA is, uh, is going to be proteins that are going to be responsible for a whole lot of behavior that the uh, viruses go through. And then surrounding that is going to be an envelope if the virus has an envelope. And then those little sticky out parts, I call them, uh, are different kinds of proteins that we're going to use to either make vaccines or to identify the virus or in some way characterize the virus and take advantage of our knowledge of that in order to, to either treat the virus or to, uh, to, to diagnose a virus. And so those sticky out parts are really important. We're going to talk about one in particular that we're using here. You're already familiar with a lot of viral-based uh, diseases or viral-caused diseases. If anybody's taking children to the doctor for their shots, they're going to get the MMR. The measles, mumps, rubella shot is, a, is in the childhood series. We also know polio, HIV, the rhinoviruses that cause most of our colds, our, uh, our RNA viruses. The flu virus is an RNA virus. And what do we know about influenza? We got to get a vaccine every year, don't we? Because it's an RNA virus that is constantly mutating and that's what creates part of the problem that we're going to be talking with today is that. And the hepat hepatitis, hepatitis B in particular, which is the one that they use to, to, to develop the te techniques that we use in healthcare to protect ourselves. Uh, those were the, the original uh, the original universal precautions that includes the PPE that you hear so much about, personal protective equipment, were developed to protect healthcare workers primarily against getting blood-borne hepatitis B. And so that's another RNA virus that we have to worry about. Underneath that, I put some bacterial diseases that you would be familiar with because of the childhood series. The DPT that the child gets, diphtheria, pertussis, which is whooping cough, and tetanus, which we 
have to be vaccinated for, and now we know whooping cough, we have to be vaccinated because immunity wears off. The kind of vaccines that are made on bacteria are not as long lasting as most of the uh, viral uh, uh, vaccines like the measles. Once you get measles immunity, you're probably going to have it for life. Keep going there. Okay. Yeah. Another important point is most viruses are not pathogenic. In fact, a lot of them, they work for us. And that's another whole story we don't have to talk about. So not all viruses are bad guys, just like all bacteria are not bad guys. Louis Pasteur said the role of the infinitely small in nature is infinitely great. And boy, has, has that a bromide been borne out well lately. Here's a photomicrograph of a coronavirus, okay? And what I've done there is I've emphasized in the middle of the word the RNA that the genome is based on, and that is what's going on there. So this is just a pretty picture to lead us into a little more about the coronavirus itself. Almost every animal that I know of has a, one or more different coronaviruses that infect it. No time for all that. We have several uh, different uh, coronaviruses that have affected us over time. And as a bit of an aside, because of that, some of us who may not be as susceptible to the uh, current coronavirus that everybody's worried about, that may be because we have cross immunity from having been exposed to other coronaviruses. And so that's provided us with some protection. That's an explanation that they use to help us better understand. Why, why is Joe getting it and Jim's not? Well, Jim may have been exposed to other coronaviruses in the past, and he's developed a little background immunity to help protect him in that regard. Uh, our, as, as I said earlier, be, because of the nature of RNA, it's not as stable as the DNA virus. Uh, uh, Chickenpox is a DNA virus, as an example. More stable virus, but the HIV, why have we not yet developed a vaccine for HIV? That virus is just constantly mutating. So that today's antibodies against the virus are only effective against yesterday's antigen because the virus has mutated away from our immune system's ability to make its antibodies and protect us. There, there's a component of that with the coronavirus too, and that's why we don't know yet if the vaccines that they're developing or if people who have already gotten sick are going to be protected next year. Will that immunity wear off? And is that because the virus has mutated away from our immune system's memory of it when we saw it the first time? Okay. Um, the envelope viruses, as I said, uh, have a lipid or fatty based surrounding. What does that mean? What do you do to get rid of the, the, uh, the, the, the soap, I mean, the, the grease in, the, in your laundry? You put soap in there, right? And that inactivates that. And that's what happens to the envelope. So just plain old soap and water, and they tell you to sing happy birthday to you twice, 20 seconds. And that is sufficient to eliminate any of the virus and uh, inactivate the virus on your hands. Whether or not we need to be adding different disinfectants or antiseptics to the mix, I think is controversial because as you already know, we worry about whether or not we're developing antibiotic resistance uh, and disinfectant resistance strains because of the overuse of chemicals and as a result, Maybe all of that alcohol and all of the Lysol that we're using to clean up the surfaces is creating another problem that we're going to have to live with at some point because of the resistant strains that had developed. And those same chemicals are killing our normal bacteria that protect us. And so you've got to really be careful when you start using chemicals. Soap and water, copious amounts of water and flushing are really the best way to go for, I think, the long term. Um, okay, I mentioned the different proteins that are embedded in one in the uh, in the uh, virus. Uh, one of them is the S 
or spike protein. That's the one we're keying in on because that's the one we're trying to develop vaccines against. Because that spike protein is like a key that's going to fit in a lock that's on the surface of our cells. The lock is a special kind of lock called the ACE2, right? That has something to do with blood pressure. No time to discuss that. But on the surface of our cells that line our respiratory tract, and I'll show you a picture of this a little bit, are lots and lots of these ACE2 receptors. That spike sticks in that, and then it opens the door, and that's how the virus gets inside of our cells. And so the cells lining the alveoli, the little bubbles inside our lungs, are loaded with these ACE2 receptors, and that's what makes pneumonia one of the biggest killers in this particular disease. Our heart muscles have a lot of ACE2 receptors. That's why people who have cardiovascular problems have a higher uh, comorbidity associated with it. And ACE2 receptors are on our kidneys and they're on our blood vessels and so they're everywhere in our body and that's how the virus takes advantage of us. That's how that virus gets inside of those cells and causes problems. Okay, The damage that actually occurs is not because of the virus itself. That sneaky little Pete isn't causing all the injury it's our own immune system's response to that virus. And in many cases, our immune systems overreact. And inflammation is the number one reason why we all end up dying over time. Because the accumulation of inflammation, the destruction of the cells and tissue that occurs over a long period of time is really our own bodies doing the damage. Okay? The uh, cytokine storm is a release of all kinds of chemicals in our immune system that are telling the cells and, and the other components of our immune system to really get the job done. And that can kill you, is a cytokine storm. Here's the lining cells in our alveoli. Those little big blue area, light blue areas in the middle are where the air is being exchanged. And the red area are the cells across which the oxygen comes in and the carbon dioxide comes out. And if you can see those little type 2 pneumocytes, those are the cells that have lots and lots of those ACE2 receptors. You damage those cells, you got a pneumonia. Right. Okay, what do, what do we got going for us? Our immune systems. Preventive medicine is the key, okay? Not getting in the first place so your, your uh, immune system uh, doesn't have to do the job, but if you do be exposed and you want to have a healthy immune system. That's preventive medicine. And so that's our major line of defense is the different components of the immune system. And I'm only going to break it down uh, into two basic uh, sides of our immune system and what protects us. I'll show you a little bit. Okay? There are two arms to the defense mechanism built into us. Okay? And they're working together. And one arm is nonspecific. It's innate. We're all born, most all of us are born with this component of the immune system protecting us. Our skin and a healthy, intact skin surface is part of that system. And then the bacteria that are living on our skin surface are competing with bad bacteria. So that's why we got to maintain a good, healthy skin floor. Don't over scrub. Right? Other components of the innate, non-specific, it means that a bad guy showed up and we don't care what gang he's from. We don't care what his name is. We just know he doesn't belong in our neighborhood and we're going to respond. And our immune system set up to have an immediate first response, inflammation being a big component of that. The uh, uh, fever is a component of that. Fever is a mixed blessing. We, no time to talk about that. The microbiome I mentioned, that's what's on the surface of our skin, lining our gut and so forth. And then the white blood, there's a group of white blood cells called neutrophils, which are first responders. Their job is to see something that doesn't belong there and literally surround it and eat it and then destroy it with enzymes. And then our white blood cells die and that is what becomes the pus in an abscess is the dead cells that gave it up for you. And they're a component of the 
immune system. But the innate system is working with the specific or acquired immune system, the other side of the immune system, because those cytokines I talked about, they're chemical messengers that are sending messages back and forth between those two sides. So they're working together in this case. The acquired system, though, we each have uniquely based upon what we've been exposed to in our lives, okay? And so if you've traveled to a foreign country and been exposed to diseases that people in the U.S. would never see, your acquired immune system now has memory of those particular bugs from somewhere else, okay? And so that is a developed component of our immune system, which is really important because it has what we call memory of what they've seen. So that if we get the disease or we're vaccinated to protect ourselves against the disease, the acquired side, the, not, the specific side of our immune system has memory, remembers that bug so that if you ever see it again, you don't have to go through being sick in order to develop, and surviving in order to develop the immunity. Now, in the acquired side, there's two special kinds of cells. I'm really narrowing this down. One is called a T cell, and it is a cell that is the general in the battle. This T cell's job is responsible for telling all the other components in the immune system using these little cytokine chemical messengers where to go, what to take out, and develop memory against that too. So if that bug ever shows up again, we can do this a whole lot faster the second time. All right. The other type of cell is being talked to by the T cell. The T cell is given the B cell information to make a specific antibody that's going to be in your fluid portion of your blood, in your plasma, and that antibody is going to take out one kind of antigen. Okay, so one antigen makes one antibody. That's important in our problem here too because we want to try to develop a more specific response by focusing and down on just the kind of antibody we need to take out that S spike protein that I talked about earlier in this case. Okay. Now, in the acquired side of the immune system, there's both a natural and an artificial way that we take advantage of our knowledge of that system or a way we get protected against the diseases and pathogens. There's four of these. Natural active immunity is developed when you get a disease causing organism, it makes you sick, you survive, and now you have what's called memory so that if you ever see that one again, you shouldn't get it again. So in the old days when measles came through town, a whole bunch of kids would get sick, then you're never going to see measles again because that's, that's the natural, active, acquired immunity that they have now that they should never get sick from measles again. Another way that we can get naturally protected is from our moms. This is the only way it works out in us. It's called natural passive because all you have to do is show up and somebody else is going to give you the antibodies you need to protect you against the environment you're going to be born into. So mom passes antibodies across the placenta that appears to be happening right now with the coronavirus. The virus can't cross for reasons we don't know, but mom's antibodies against the virus can cross so that a baby can be born into an environment already protected against the coronavirus. And mom can give antibodies and protection to the baby from her milk too. Artificial active is what we do when we vaccinate. It, we develop a type or a form or a, or a, a, different, uh, a different type of the bad guy and then we give that to somebody and they develop artificial because this is made in labs and, 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 and in factories and stuff. And we develop an active immunity now with the memory that I just mentioned. And the, now the way we protect our kids against measles, they don't have to get the measles to be protected if they survive. All they need to do is get the vaccination and then if measles shows up, they don't have to get sick or they don't get as sick as a result of that. And then finally, there's artificial passive, which is important in this problem too, because this is what they're asking people who have been sick from coronavirus 
to go and donate blood, and then they take the plasma, and in the plasma are going to be antibodies against the coronavirus, and they're going to concentrate those, isolate those, and give those to people that are really sick from coronavirus, and they're going to get somebody else's immune. They're passively laying back and getting antibodies from somebody else, and that's another way that we have of protecting ourselves. Those are the four arms, okay? Those plasma donors are lifesavers. And so if you've been infected and you've got antibodies, uh, we'd love to have your blood. Versity is, uh, uh, is checking everybody's blood when they donate to see whether or not they've been exposed. Lori and I donated not too long ago and they sent us information that we don't have antibodies. And so, um, um, that, so yeah. Let me, let me start moving you toward the questions. We'll give some time for people to ask questions. But what do you think then? It's incredible. The human body is incredible, isn't it? I mean, just awe and wonder. So what do you think churches of the response that we're presently taking? What do you think masks, you know, distancing? Okay. What do you think of those? Things? All right. I, I, I'll, I'll jump ahead here then and I'll answer your question. Here's what we're... Here's what we want to do, is we want to develop herd immunity or community immunity, whatever you want to go. Some people are offended because when they hear the word herd, they think we're talking about animals and that we're going to end up uh, uh, getting rid of you like we would in an animal herd if you had a disease like that. That's not that. That's not a strategy. This is an end point. This is what we're trying to get so that most of us all are protected. Okay, so I, I, I think I can answer your question. The goal is to get 90% of the population protected, either naturally or artificially. It doesn't matter. Okay, and if we can get 90% protected, that 10% of the population that doesn't have protection, it may be children, it may be people who have immunosuppressive diseases, it may be people who refuse to vaccinate for whatever reason. They're being protected because there's enough people out here with protection that that group now is going to be indirectly protected. Okay, that's what we're uh, what we're heading for. Okay, sadly though, and this is where you're you're, you're coming in politics, mis misinformation, and the paranoia have made it a difficult problem to solve. So we got to do a risk benefit analysis in order to in order to get through this. Okay. Can we afford to have zero deaths from this disease? Is that reasonable? I, I, it's impossible. If we, if we use that strategy, then we would have to take it to its logical conclusion. And 100% of our, of our wealth is going to have to go to saving lives. It means we're going to have to reduce the speed on the interstate to 25 miles an hour if we use that kind of thinking. So we got to come up with compromises here in order to get us through this. All right. And so flattening the curve is what we're attempting to do here. And if we flatten the curve, inevitably, we're going to see the kind of surges that because that's just exactly what we're going through right now. We flatten the curve. Here's what we did. And this is a pretty good depiction of what has gone on here. Okay, so without mitigation, we have a whole bunch of people. With mitigation, lockdowns and masks and so forth, we learn. But what this doesn't show is the inevitable blurb that goes all the way out to the right, all the way out to your right here. That doesn't stay at baseline. That's just like pushing on a balloon, right? You push on this end, what happens on that end? It gets bigger, right? Because when we hide people from the disease, they don't get the immunity they need to protect themselves. And we're hiding the people that are going to have the biggest amount of protection, and that's our kids. The youngsters have to be exposed or we have to have a vaccination. I, don't, I mean, it doesn't matter how you go about doing that. They, they are, and I talked to a pediatrician yesterday, I said, how are your kids doing? And he says they're doing great. I says, what, what do you think about uh, uh, the lockdowns and keeping the kids out of school? And he says, well, they're the biggest carriers. They're the ones that are going to take it home to grandpa. That's a dilemma. That's the risk benefit that we have to decide on. So if we're going to get those kids immunized, either artificially or naturally, we're going to have to assume that there's going to be some risk associated with that. That's a... That's a price that may have to be paid while we wait for the vaccine to occur. Okay, so uh, the, I, I won't go through 
through the epidemiology about this. And I'll, I'll, do, I'll talk a little bit about the testing that's being done in order to help us understand where we are, okay? The testing in the beginning was really all over the place. It wasn't accurate and it wasn't re being reported accurately. And so the numbers that we were getting back originally were bogus, I'll just tell you, bad science, okay? Now the tests are getting better and as a result of that, what are we seeing? More positive cases, duh. That's what you would have expected as the testing got better and as you let people out to be re-exposed. You open the schools back up again and the rate went up, big surprise. That's what would have, should have been effect, uh, uh, expected by our healthcare workers. So we got a couple of tests. We got a really rapid test that we use a, a direct antigen. We're actually looking for the surface of the virus and we have developed antibodies in a lab against that. And if those antibodies react with that sample from your nose or from sputum that you coughed up, that will change color on the chart and that's a rapid test that we have. Sadly, it's also very sensitive and so we have a lot of false positives when someone may not necessarily be positive, but because the test is so sensitive, it picks up outliers and comes that way. And so when you see stories about people having two positive and two negative tests in the same day, that's one of the explanations for that. A much better test that we have looks for the RNA of that particular virus and it's very specific. And so we take that and we expand it and blow it up. We, we, uh, uh, we polymerize it and we do a chain reaction so that that teeny tiny little bit of RNA can be blown up so that we can see it. That's the test that when you get that one back, it usually takes a couple of days or longer to get because it takes more time in the lab to get that particular test done. But when that one's positive, that's the real deal inevitably because it's very specific. One more test, uh, uh, and we get those samples from, from uh, respiratory, uh, respiratory. Another test is an indirect test. We're not looking for the actual bad guy, we're looking for the consequences of the bad guy having been in our body. That's the production of our antibodies. And so we'll take blood from somebody that's been exposed and we usually have to go out two weeks or more to, so that they've made enough antibodies so when we do the test we can say, yeah, they had the coronavirus and that's the indirect test that we're using to, uh, to see if someone had been exposed in the past. It doesn't help us much when in a clinical setting. We've got about 10 more minutes here, so I want to uh, hope, give people a chance to ask some questions if they would like. And uh, otherwise, I'll have a couple. But any questions you want to ask? A lot, I know we're packing a lot of stuff in here, but any specific questions that have come to mind? <laughs> Shout out anytime. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, with the viruses being so tiny, what's the effect of us of the mask? Here we go. All right, let's go right to you. Masks are what everybody wants to know about. All right, I'm going to go to the masks. Here's uh, why you want to stay home or see the doc, okay? Uh, common symptoms that are there. And these are all in the handout, so you can see that. The vaccine. Uh, so far, so good. That's some of the good news in this, okay? I'm making several assumptions, okay? We'll, we'll get to that. Social distancing and isolation, obviously, if you don't get out of your house, you don't have to worry about being exposed, okay? Uh, the routine concern we used to have in the past for our neighbors, Gesundheit is the German word for good health to you. You know, just practice that. Sneeze in your sleep if you have to. And make sure you're washing your hands. And so all those common things that we do. Hand sanitizer we talked about a little bit. Uh, the virus can live on surfaces like shopping carts and so forth, but for a very short period of time. If they're wiped down, that's probably a pretty good way of, of doing it. So anything that can carry the virus is a fomite and we want to protect ourselves there. Okay, face masks. If you're wearing one of those like most of you have on out here, you're not protecting yourselves. Sorry, if you, huh? Oh, 
If you want to protect yourself, you got to wear an N95. You've heard of them over and over again. You got to wear it in your size. You got to have it properly fit tested. And that means that you go to a respiratory therapist who does that for a living and they make sure that there's no leaks in there. And that'll take care of most of the bugs that we're concerned about. But if you're not wearing one of these and you're just wearing one of those one of those pie pans in front of your face, you're not protecting you. The air's coming in here, it's coming in here, and you're doing this and you're doing that. And, and they get wore out and they get bigger holes in them so more stuff can get through. They are good for, if you sneeze and you got corona, preventing somebody else from being exposed to a lot of them. It doesn't cut it all out though, okay? So even at that, all you're doing is reducing the number of viral particles that are, that are in the air. Now, the, the really bad news about the, the, um, the surgical and cloth mask and all the mask shaming that's been going on right now is there's no science behind what they're telling us. No one has done any study until Wednesday, the first study that I come across, and, and I didn't get it until just uh, uh, two days ago, but it came out on November 18th. It was a Danish study where they finally put masks on people. They checked them out before and after, and they came up with this bottom line. A Danish study released Wednesday suggests face masks did not significantly protect wearers from the coronavirus compared to those without masks. This is the first scientific, and it was, it was uh, published. Nobody wanted to publish this. The Annals of uh, Internal Medicine, which is a reputable journal, finally took the risk and put it out there. And you should see the comments that have followed. As you might imagine, people going, aha, that's what I suspected. And the list goes on and on about the people that are outraged because somebody finds, and there's more information if anybody's inter interested in reading uh, about the statistics that are in here. Last Sunday's um, Wall Street Journal had an article about the Swiss cheese model for combined, combating COVID-19. And here is a doctor from Yale, and, and, and this is what he publishes. This is why we're in such a dilemma. Here, he says, masks alone have, can have a large effect on respiratory pandemics. And, and then he comes up with numbers. He says, a mask with just 50% efficacy, I mean, just 50% in reducing droplet transmission worn by just 50% of people can reduce the infectiousness of the virus from 2.4 new cases per old case to about 1.35. There's no citation in here as to where he came up with this. How was the study run? How did he determine infectivity? Who, who were the people that went in? Who were the controls? Who, and, and none of that is in here, and he gets to publish in the Wall Street Journal BS. I'm sorry to say that in church, but that's why we're in such a state of confusion. Here's why I wear a mask. I mean, besides the fact that you have to in so many places, it's because it gives you a psychological feeling of goodwill. Bly is taken care of, of Gunderson because I'm wearing a mask. That's it. It's psychological primarily, though, folks. But we got to play the game because we are being pressured to do this by people who call it good science, but it's not good science. And that, that uh, let me see if I, I think I had, uh, yeah, the vaccine, um, I, I wanted to say Pfizer's vaccine is uh, looking pretty good. Right? What does it do? It takes a part of the RNA that's in the coronavirus that makes the spike protein, puts them into these little lipid envelopes, they get inside of our muscle cells. They get the injection. And that messenger RNA that's there takes over the machinery of our cells, and our cells then make the spike protein that goes into our blood. Our immune system picks up that foreign antigen, makes antibodies against it, creates memory against that, and now if we ever see the real deal, we are immunized. We don't know yet for how long.
We've got a couple minutes left. Any questions that anybody else has? Yes, Trudy. The, the study that you had said that that a mask does not help you. Does it say anything about you helping them? That, that was yeah. That's the rest of that study. No, there's no either direction. Right. Yes. That, yes, ma'am. That's a great point. Okay. And will you personally get a vaccine? Yes. As soon as it's available, if you can. I will because I got stock in Pfizer and I want to see the. the No, I, and I, I, I was in the original hepatitis A vaccine studies and the original hepatitis B vaccine studies, and I'm here to talk about it. So I, I'm pretty confident that they're doing a good job. Question, when I was having blood work done the other day, the nurse said that vitamin D and zinc help. Good, I, I, and, and that, that should have been in here. Vitamin D3 from a reputable source is is good be careful where you're getting it from though okay i won't talk any more about that and zinc is also effective so yes but don't overdo anything folks because too much of a good thing is a bad thing okay so be careful about that if you can get your vitamin d from the sun that's much preferable than yeah we also heard that it doesn't matter how much zinc you take that it the body exits it it'll just get rid of it <laughs> fortunately zinc yes that's true. You, so you can't overdose. You, you, Paracelsus said the poison is in the dose. All right. So if you eat uh, 300 pounds of carrots, you're going to get vitamin, vitamin A toxicity. Getting back to the Yale study. Yeah. How many people participated? Well, that's the point. It, he, he did. He, there was no reference to who they were, how many they were, and and that's that's a great observation. Question: How long is the N95? Mask work. Does it wear out? Well, the that that was, I I briefly stated that when we every time we handle this we make bigger holes in the in the in the pores. I mean that that's just the nature of the cloth, and so the, they don't last longer than the period of time. You've, because they're pretty expensive. Oh, the N95s. The, these. But yeah, if you if you wear these properly and they're fitted properly, these will last. You can wear these for several days. If you don't get them wet and, and whatnot, and they've got a they've got a version now you can wash, so oh. yeah. Um, I have um, an interest in um, the overall picture of our health with other viruses around when we're totally closed off and, and keeping everything out. How we're not exercising our immune system and bringing it down. And, and I have a great concern for that for a lot of people who have comorbidities and don't look at the other things. Yes, ma'am. They're all focused and afraid of COVID. Yep. It, it, yes, the immune system needs a constant workout. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And then this is my last concern. Yeah. Give your last concern. Your my, last. my last concern is that one, and you already touched on it, who's going to take the vaccines once they come? Are we all going to wait until Joe takes it, see if he gets okay or not? Or are we going to line up? Because we got to hit that 90% in order to protect the whole herd. And yeah. One last question. What age do people become more vulnerable in your estimate? Do you, th you yeah. think at a certain age? You yeah, there, there, there's, there's statistics that show as you go up 10 year groups, there's about a five to 7% increase in susceptibility. And so people uh, above 70 are at like a the highest risk all right and the kids are at a really low risk that we shouldn't worry about let, let th this is the last thing if you want more information about how we're going to create the herd immunity the great barrington declaration.org is written by uh, <clears throat> three doctors who are competent and signed by thousands of doctors and that's something i think everybody should see